today. Uh, today we're actually going to be concluding the teaching series that we're going through on prayer. We've been going through this acronym. Uh, does anyone remember the acronym? It's on the screen. Yeah, pray. If you want to learn how to pray, just pray. And uh, it's pause. The first week we looked at how it's important to slow down. This is the prayer without words. Center on God and uh, be still and listen to God and know that he is God and and, and you can be more in touch with your own soul, with, with God's presence in your life, just by pausing uh, in prayer. The next week, we looked at rejoicing in the Lord, praising God. That's what we just did as we we're singing. That's, songs of worship are prayers. They're, they're ways that we're, as a church, praying and praising God together. But you can also do that in your prayer life. You can tell God how awesome he is. You can thank God for his blessings in your life. Last week, we looked at how we ask God for things, and as counterintuitive as it is, we might think that we're experts at asking God for things because that's mostly what we do in our prayer, and yet there's a certain way to ask God for things and a certain way not to ask God for things, and uh, we looked at Jesus' teaching through the parable of the friend at midnight who goes uh, to one of his, his friends, and he knocks on the door, and he asks for three loaves of bread, and Jesus teaches us that he's gonna get that bread not because they're buddies, not because of the relationship, but because of his boldness in which he asks. Uh, the, the, you know, he's unashamed. He has this audacity in which he asks his friend for bread. And Jesus teaches us that's how we should approach God. God is like that friend, or God is your father, and you can approach him and be honest with him uh, when you ask him for things in your life. Well, I would encourage you, if you've missed any of those three teachings, go back, listen to those. Each one of them, I would say, will stretch you in those areas of prayer in your life. But today really balances out what we talked about last week. Uh, I want to pose the question like this from, from asking God with that boldness, with that shameless audacity. What happens when you knock on the door of heaven, you ask for three loaves of bread, and God says no? Have you, have you experienced that in your life? I think if we're honest, if you're, if you're a praying person, you experience that. You experience the tension of unanswered prayer. You experience God allowing you to go through situations that you're praying for deliverance from, you're praying for freedom from, and sometimes God doesn't give you what you ask for. And so what do we do when that happens? Well, the answer is on the screen. We yield. We yield to what God is allowing us to go through. We yield to his will. We yield to the, the situation that God is allowing, and it's the most difficult form of prayer, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, this, this kind of prayer, this yielding to God is tough. It's more like a wrestling match than a nice devotional time. You know, we love like pausing, just silence and stillness, and maybe you have a worship song playing or whatever. This kind of prayer, this yielding kind of prayer is more like a wrestling match. I think about the book of Genesis where Jacob wrestles with God. Jacob wrestles with God, and he wrestles all night, and it's sweaty, and it's difficult, and stuff. It's probably painful. Uh, God pops his hip out of socket. If you've ever had something like, you know, like a joint go out of socket, God pops his hip out of socket, and finally, Jacob is forced to do what? He's forced to yield, and God actually changes his, his entire, you know, destiny at that moment. He renames Jacob Israel, and for the rest of Jacob's days, he walks with a limp, he remembers this, this is a significant moment in his journey. But Jacob, if you read through the book of Genesis, is different from that moment on, from that encounter with God. And so some of the biggest breakthroughs in our faith don't just come from when we ask God for what we want and he gives us what we want, but actually when we yield to him. And when, when there's, a, there's a time and a place to pray persistently and to continue to ask and to be bold. And there's also a time to recognize and understand when God is moving us a different direction. So today we're going to learn a little bit about why. We're going to talk a little bit about why, but mostly I want to talk about how. How do we yield? Uh, it's a difficult thing to do. How do we yield in our lives? So let's talk about why of unanswered prayer. Again, I'm not going to be able to cover this super in depth, and the reality is when it comes to unanswered prayer, you may not ever get the answer to the question why. Sometimes why, you know, when you're going through difficult times, sometimes why is even the wrong question. And, uh, but here's three simple you know, answers, three possibilities for why. These come from Pete Gregg, his book on prayer, and his prayer course online as well. Uh, the first reason why you might experience unanswered prayer is God's world. It's the world that we live in. Uh, there's such a thing in kind of theological circles called God's general providence and God's special or specific providence. So God's general providence would be like the law of gravity. 
God invented gravity. God, you know, put certain things in motion and he allows his general providence. He still upholds all things. He still is overseeing the universe. But then there's God's special providence where, where God performs a miracle and he does something outside of the normal way that things work. We believe in both. We believe that God interacts in our world and in our lives in both ways. And yet, you know, even if you're a Christian, think about this, even if you're a follower of Jesus and you know that, that God loves you, if you drop a hammer on your toe, what's gonna happen? It'll hurt. It'll hit your toe. You don't have a hedge of protection around your toe, okay, just because you're a follower of Jesus. And the reality is that's God's general providence, that God is just allowing his world to operate as he has made it to operate. Pete Gregg says this. He says, if every bride had a sunny wedding day, then farmers would be praying in vain for it to rain for their crops. It just makes sense, right? And so sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers because he's saying, that's not, what, that's not how I want the world to operate. And God isn't always intervening and controlling every micro detail. God is supreme and he reigns sovereign, and yet he's allowing general providence to interact with our world. The second reason why we might experience unanswered prayer is God's war. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against these spiritual forces of darkness. And he teaches us to pray through and to suit up with the armor of God, to fight against the devil and his schemes. And so for us, we don't like to talk about this in kind of like post-enlightenment, you know, modern, materialistic, naturalistic worldview that we have in, you know, modern day Western civilization. The reality is there are forces at work beyond what you and I see. The spiritual realm is real. Jesus believes in that, and we should believe in that as well. And so there's God's war. Evil is at work in the world. And yet, the victory is already set. The victory has already been won. And so we live in this unique uh, space between Jesus' come to this earth, he died on the cross, he rose from the grave, and one day he's coming back, and we know that he will make all things new, and, and death will be done away with, and sickness, and disease, and pain, and all evil will be done away with. We live in between those two events. And so for you and I, even though the victory is determined, the battle still rages on. The war still rages on. And so we have this confidence in the destiny. We have this confidence in the direction that God is leading us towards, that all history is going towards. And yet, we still experience the effects of evil in this world. And so that's another reason uh, why what you're praying for may not, may not take into effect right away. And then the last reason, and maybe this is the most difficult part, it's just God's will. That's a fancy way of saying what God wants. Sometimes what you're praying for, what, what your will is or what you want, is not what God wants. And it's hard for us to understand that. Uh, it's difficult for us to get that. I love what Richard Foster says about this. He says, part of the answer to why God doesn't answer all our prayers, part of the answer lies in the fact that frequently we hold on so tightly to the good we know that we cannot receive the greater good that we do not know. God has to help us let go of our tiny vision in order to release the greater good that he has in store for us. And that's difficult reality to do. Uh, Tim Keller, in his book on prayer, says that God will either give us what we ask for or give us what we would have asked for if we knew what he knows. That God's ways are higher than our ways, the prophet Isaiah teaches us. And God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And we like to pretend that we can educate God and we, we have a better plan for our lives or we have a better way of working these things out. And sometimes God just says, no, you don't. No, you don't. And God allows us to go through trials and suffering. We know that. Jesus promised in this world you will have trials. That's a time that we yield God sometimes directs us, closes doors. I think about Paul wanting to go to Asia to do ministry, and the Holy Spirit says, no, you're going to Macedonia. Sometimes God directs us in a different way. Those are times we need to yield. And then there's also times where we have been outside of God's will, and we need to yield and repent and seek forgiveness. So two main kinds of yielding prayer we're going to talk about today. The first kind is to relinquish. That's that if you have a really tight grip on something, just to let go, to loosen control, and to allow God to be God. And so that's trusting in God's will, trusting God's will for your life instead of trying to assert your own will. And then the second kind is when you've been living outside of God's will or you've sinned, you've done something outside of God's will to yield to him, to, to allow yourself to repent, to confess, and to turn back to God in those areas in our lives. And this is what I mean. There's a lot of fruit that comes from this kind of prayer. Some of the deepest growth that you can experience in your life following Jesus comes from these kinds of prayers where you learn to yield. So our text for today was Mark chapter 14. That's our main text. So if you have a Bible, you can open to the gospel of Mark uh, 
in the New Testament. Mark 14 is where we will be. If you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand, and an usher can get you a paper Bible. And let me set the scene for you in Mark chapter 14. Uh, This is the night that Jesus is betrayed. This is actually the hour that Jesus is betrayed, the, the, the hours right leading up to Judas showing up with the soldiers. He's about to go on trial, falsely accused, be beaten, crown of thorns, flogged, put on a cross, and die for the sins of the world. So we're reading the, his final moments. Think of if you knew how you were going to die, how would you spend those final moments before you began suffering? And Jesus strikingly chooses to spend those moments in prayer. And this is one of the, I would say, what we see recorded in Mark chapter 14 is the most difficult prayer anyone has ever prayed. You see the strain in Jesus' voice. Like, picture, picture what we're about to read. Garden of Gethsemane, nighttime, Jesus with his disciples. Let's go ahead and jump into the text. Mark chapter 14, verse 32. And they, that's the disciples, went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with them Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, notice what Jesus prays for, if it were possible that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. So a few things I want to point out about this. Are you, imagine, are you visualizing what's going on here? Luke tells us in, in his gospel that Jesus is actually sweating drops of blood. Okay, So he, he says, my soul is sorrowful even to the point of death. This is this incredibly difficult situation. When he's praying that a cup would be taken for him, he's not talking about an actual you know, like cup, that's, that's a metaphor. Read the Old Testament. It talks about God's cup of wrath being poured out on nations when they're disobedient generation after generation. And this is this cup of wrath that we all deserve because of our sins. And so this is the, the wrath that every human being on the earth deserves for the sin they've committed. Human beings alive now, human beings that have ever lived, and human beings that ever will live, okay? Okay. So the disciples, when Jesus is talking earlier in the upper room, Jesus is talking about he's about to go through something difficult, he's about to die, and, and they say, no, we will, you know, we will shoulder that load with you. Jesus says, you have no idea what you're saying. You cannot carry the cup. You cannot drink the cup that I'm about to drink. That's the cup that Jesus is praying about, okay? So this is a big deal. There's a reason why he's sweating drops of blood at this moment. He's, he's not joking when he's saying, my soul is sorrowful, even to the point of death. He knows exactly what is coming. And yet look at what he does. He prays. And he prays one of the most honest, vulnerable prayers that anyone could pray. A couple things I want to point out as well is Gethsemane, we don't know this 100% for sure, but Gethsemane is likely when Jesus was around Jerusalem, you know how Jesus often withdrew to quiet places, solitary places to pray. Guess, the Garden of Gethsemane is likely one of those places. Uh, it's right in the lower part of the Mount of Olives, and it's kind of this olive grove or garden. And this is probably one of those places Jesus has prayed dozens, maybe hundreds of prayers in his life. And it's kind of his go-to place to meet with his father. It's quiet, it's beautiful. Jesus often connected with his father through nature. And here it's turned from a devotional place to a place of wrestling. This is now this really brutally honest, vulnerable moment. I believe that's one of the benefits for you and I in our lives to establish a quiet place where you often go to pray. Because when life is difficult and when you have no direction and when you're, you have this weight on your shoulders, you now have a place to go to sort those things out and to wrestle with God. Uh, another thing that he does, which is different than what we often do, is he invites his friends into this moment. This is really significant. Often when you and I are struggling with a decision or we're struggling with a suffering in our lives, we isolate ourselves. We kind of, we, we try to shoulder it all uh, ourselves. And we kind of run away. People ask us how we're doing. I'm oh, fine. I don't really want to talk about it. And we kind of uh, depart from other people in our lives. And look at what Jesus, the son of God does. He, of course, invites his father, and that's his main source of strength in this moment, right, connecting with God, and yet he invites three of his closest friends, Peter, James, and John, into this moment. 
they can't help him whatsoever in this moment. Notice, they can't, he's already told them, you can't drink of this cup. So they're not shouldering the, the burden or the load whatsoever, but their, their mere presence is comforting to him. That's a lesson for you and I when it comes to helping people in, when they're suffering. One of the best things you can do is just be there. Not offering advice, not even saying anything, but just your presence with people who are going through suffering is one of those powerful things you can offer. And Jesus takes his friends up on this. He invites them vulnerably into this moment. Now, what I want to do is I want to focus on the words because Jesus prays this prayer. So I want to break down this prayer line by line and look at what we can learn for prayers of relinquishment. This is a model prayer of relinquishment. So first of all, what we learn is Jesus prays this prayer out of the foundation of love. He says, Abba, Father. Now, the Jews would never use, the Jews in Jesus' day would never use the word Abba to describe God. They knew that God was you know, the father of, uh, father of their nation, the, their father technically in heaven. And yet the word Abba is this Aramaic word. For us, maybe a, a close equivalent would be, you know, if you're talking to your dad, your earthly dad, instead of saying sir, you know, maybe you grew up in a strict household and it was, you better call me sir. It's, you can call me dad. Or maybe even a young child would call their dad, what? Daddy. That's what my daughter often says, dada or daddy, right? That's the word Abba. And it's almost, Jews in Jesus' day would say, that's scandalous. How, how informal you know, of a relationship do you have with God to say Abba when you're talking to God? And yet Paul teaches us in Romans that we can cry Abba Father as well. We've been adopted into God's family. And so what I want you to see is even in this moment of deep vulnerability, Jesus never doubts God's love for him or his position as the son of God. And for us, think about that. When we're facing a trial, one of the go-to questions is, God, do you even, what, care? God, do you even care about me if you're allowing me to go through this? And there's not an ounce of doubt that, that God is his father. He, he affirms that, that relationship of love, and you and I need to affirm those relationships of love with God as well. The next thing I want to show you is not only does Jesus affirm this love relationship he has with his father, he affirms faith. He hasn't lost faith. He says, God, all things are possible for you. The second thing that we tend to doubt when we're going through difficult situations is not, God, do you even care, but God, can you even do anything? Are you even able? We start to almost doubt this is the almighty God of the universe. We doubt that he can even intervene. We doubt that he's even able to do anything. So Jesus affirms in faith that he recognizes God's power. He says, Abba, Father, all things are possible. That's, that's a good lesson for us when it comes to that wrestling match, still acknowledging God's love, still having faith in God's ability and God's power. And then he makes this scandalous request. It's a petition as we talked about last week. This isn't an intercession. He's not praying for other people. Jesus says, take this cup from who? Me. He's praying for himself. And this is bold ask. Jesus knows why he's going to go to the cross. He knows why he's going to suffer. And he asks for if there's another, if there's some other way, could we do that? Could we go another direction? And it's almost unbiblical, isn't it? When you, like, for thousands of years, prophecies have been talking about this, and Jesus is going to have to die. And yet, he's extremely honest, and I want to tell you, that is one of the most important things for you to do in your life with God, to just be brutally honest with him, with your prayers, even if it seems a little scandalous or a little unbiblical, that in order to get to that point where you finally roll over and yield, you have to do the work of wrestling. You have to really genuinely wrestle with God in those moments. I know I've done that in in moments in my life, and that's led me to a stronger faith when I'm just honest with God. And then the fourth thing, though, this is the the prayer of relinquishment. Uh, I've been teaching you kind of a a simple one-line memory verse from Scripture to remember, like, this is the epitome of that kind of prayer. This is the epitome of a prayer of relinquishment. The prayer of relinquishment is yet not what I will, but what you will. Memorize that. Pray that in your life. You could end every prayer like that if you wanted to. Yet not what I will, what you will. Not what I will, what you will. And we see that Jesus isn't just giving lip service to this. He means it. We know he means it because in less than 24 hours, he would be nailed to a cross. So, so he's asking for a way out and yet he's fully submitted knowing that he's not going to get a way out. That's what it means to yield. And for you and I in our lives, that is the epitome of true faith 
in Christ. Now, this is an amazing prayer that Jesus prays. And I would say this is like the model, okay? This is like cream of the crop, look to this kind of prayer. And yet, it's a, if we're honest, it's a little inaccessible to us. Because last I checked, you and I won't be dying for the sins of the world anytime soon, will we? And so it's easy for, you know, to, to look at this and be like, yeah, but it's a big deal that Jesus goes to the cross. And he knows, you know, this is like all of history has been leading towards this. And now all of history is looking back at this. This is a big deal moment. So what I want to do is I want to look at one more example from scripture of a prayer of relinquishment. And this comes from the apostle Paul. So if you have your Bible and you want to flip over just a few pages, uh, well, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is where this comes in. And uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is praying also that God would do something, would take something away from him, and God says no. And I want, this is, I think, a little bit more relatable everyday life for you and for me. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 7, the Apostle Paul says this, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. So Paul has been having these extremely you know, vibrant visions and revelations from God. He's just been talking about those. He says, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. He talks about God's war right there. This, the Satan's been using this thorn in the flesh to, to harass him. In verse 8, he says, three times. How many times did Jesus pray in the garden that the cup would be taken? It's three. So here Paul says that as well. He said, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me, but he said to me. So this is a listening prayer. Paul was listening to the Holy Spirit speaking to him. He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, if you know anything about the ministry of Paul, if you've read through the book of Acts or you've read through some of Paul's letters in the New Testament, you know that he did not have a cushy ministry job. He had a very difficult ministry. In fact, you can read one chapter previously. He's reminded the Corinthians of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He lists out all the ways he's suffered. In fact, when God calls Paul to ministry, God says, I will show him how much he must what? Suffer for my sake, right? I've never been put in prison for preaching the gospel. I've never been beaten because I preached the gospel, right? I look at like the ministry I have. There's hard days, there's good days, but Paul had it really difficult, okay? He had a really, really difficult ministry. And for him, what I want to point out about this is most of the time, you can see a correlation between the, the, the suffering or you know, what God is allowing him to go through and the ministry taking place. So Acts 16, we looked at this a few weeks ago, but Paul goes to Philippi and he's going to plant a church in Philippi and he's beaten with rods and thrown in prison. Well, what ends up happening is when they're, their faith in God in prison ends up leading to the Philippian jailer getting converted. And so it's easy to see like, oh, I suffered, but look at how God used the suffering, right? That's an amazing testament to, to God. He was working things together for the good of those who love him. So that's awesome. But here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the only reason Paul can come up with for this thorn in the flesh, and by the way, scholars still disagree that we're not sure what the thorn in the flesh is. Probably not a literal thorn. This is probably a metaphor for something. It's not like he has a splinter. It's like, oh man, this splinter is killing me or whatever, right? It's some kind of ailment, probably a physical ailment. Some people speculate maybe his vision was going because he had other people help him pen some of his letters, something like that. Honestly, we don't know. You know, pick your disease of choice and kind of say like, Paul's struggling with something there. The best reason Paul can come up with for why God has allowed him to have this thorn in the flesh is to humble him. Not to plant more churches, not to help more people get converted, it's just to keep them humble. That is frustrating, right? If we're honest, think about that. And he's like, I think it's maybe because I'm a little too proud. I've asked God three times, and he gets this clear, maybe he would keep asking God, right? This is the difference between praying persistently and not giving up in prayer. If you have someone who you want to see come to know Jesus, never give up on praying for them. That is a moment to pray and not lose heart and pray with persistence for that person. Okay, if you're confident that what you're praying for is in God's will, then pray boldly for those things. But this is a moment where Paul prays three times. He says, I'm not even gonna pray anymore. Every time I've asked God for this, I feel like he's telling me the same line. 
my grace is sufficient for you. And I prayed again, my grace is sufficient for you. And I prayed a third time, my grace is sufficient for you. And Paul is taking that as God saying, stop asking me. Because my will for you in this moment is that you would continue to have this thorn in the flesh. And Paul's like, maybe it's to keep me humble, to prevent me from being conceited. But two benefits that we see from this is one, Paul believes that even though God is allowing him to go through this trial, that God's grace still rests on him. That this, that this isn't some kind of weird punishment that God has. This isn't some kind of cosmic karma that God is punishing him because he didn't do good enough or whatever. That he still has 100% confidence in God's love for him and he has faith in the gospel, right? So he believes in the grace and God's grace is sufficient for him. The second thing, though, that I think is so powerful is the fact that what Paul is learning through this thorn in the flesh is it actually gives him a, a, a more access to God's power, that God's power is perfected in his weakness, that this weakness that, that Paul has is actually making him depend on God all the more, and he's seeing breakthroughs. We don't know exactly what those are, but he's seeing breakthroughs as far as unleashing God's power in his life and in ministry. And that's amazing. That's what I'm saying. When you yield to God, when you have that kind of faith and you're content with all, like even calamities, like that word catches me for whatever reason. Like, I don't know if I would say I would be content with calamities in my life, but Paul is content with that. He says, in Christ, I'm content with these things because he's understanding that when I am weak, then I am strong. And that's the essence of praying those prayers of relinquishing. Really, really important. The key word for prayers of relinquishment is trust. Trust that even when it seems like the direction you're going is difficult or there's a trial or you know, God is not answering your prayer in one way or another, that that doesn't mean that God is absent in those moments. That God is with you, his grace is sufficient for you, and in fact, God can do powerful things even in those difficult moments. And there's moments where it's appropriate to mourn. And to, to, this doesn't mean you have to just pretend that everything's fine all the time. In fact, in Romans 8, Paul says that the Holy Spirit actually intercedes for us with prayers and groanings that we don't even have the words to say. We talked about this on the first week when we looked at Samuel. Samuel's mom, Hannah, is in the synagogue, and she's praying, but she can't even mouth words. She's so distressed. And you and I get to those points in our lives, and when we do that and when we yield, that's when we see God do powerful things in our lives. So that's, okay, the first kind of prayer, prayers of relinquishing. Let's turn back to Mark chapter 14. Let's look at the other kind of yielding. Mark 14, verse 37. And he came and he found them sleeping. And he said to the Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away and prayed, saying the same words. So this is the second time Jesus prays. And again, found them sleeping. For their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. You ever do that? Like the teacher calls on you in class, and you're like, uh, skip, pass. You know, like that's this moment. They fell asleep again. And he came to them a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Is it enough? Or it is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And then Jesus comes with the soldiers, and we see the crucifixion. So, this is a moment where I just want to point out this, highlight this idea that your own willpower is not sufficient for following Jesus. And we see this in this, this moment where in the upper room, in actually in uh, verse t- uh, 31, Peter has promised, you know, I will never deny you because Jesus prophesied before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. He said, I will never deny you. If I have to, I will die for you. And then in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says, you just fell asleep three times when I asked you not to fall asleep. And you're going to die for me? Right? And then, and then, as you know, by the end of that night, Peter will deny Jesus three times. And so the lesson to learn from this is no matter how much you feel like your, your inner person is strong and you have this willpower to follow Jesus, listen to the teachings of Jesus. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so he says, watch and pray that you may not fall into temptation. We need to invite God to lead us because even if you're saved, even if you've made a decision to follow Jesus and you experience forgiveness, that we still struggle. We still face temptations and we still, if we're honest, fail in those temptations and we fall into sin once. Again, this is why in the Lord's Prayer, in Matthew chapter six, Jesus teaches us, he teaches us to pray consistently, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Jesus teaches us to pray for that time and time and time again. Now, the word that Jesus used here for sin isn't sin. The word he uses is debts. And it's a unique word. It's only used a few times in uh, the New Testament. It's, o- it's aphilema. Aphilema. It's the word debt. And Luke clarifies in Luke 11 that in Luke 11's version of the Lord's Prayer, he says, forgive us our sins. So he, he clarifies he is talking about sin. Now, that word debt literally is describing some kind of financial debt that you owe. Think about a credit card. You know, you've spent so much money on a credit card, you have to pay it back. You are legally, you know, you're bound to pay that sort of debt back. And what Jesus is comparing our sins to is debt, saying that, that in our lives, the ways we've rebelled against God, the ways that our, that our flesh has failed us, is we owe an insurmountable debt. It's a debt that we will never be able to pay back. There's not enough good things or righteous things that you can do to counteract the rebellion against God. There's no scrubbing that debt clean. Now, the beautiful good news of the gospel is we don't have to because of Jesus. That's the whole point of the cross. Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, that the record of debt has been set aside having been what? Nailed to the cross. That's the good news of the gospel. It's not the record of debt has been set aside because man, you got enough good stars to kind of erase that. The record of debt is only able to be set aside because it's been nailed to the cross of Christ. That's forgiveness. That's the good news of the gospel. And yet, there's a way to abuse that, isn't there? In fact, Paul speaks to this in Romans chapter six, where he asks the rhetorical question. So he's talked about grace. He's talked about the gospel. He says, so, so what now? Shall we keep sinning so that grace may increase? And he says, by no means. Think about it like... It, Again, with debt. Imagine you, know, you have a credit card with debt, and every time you sin, you're racking up the debt. What Paul's saying is, don't feel like when Jesus died on the cross for your sins that he's now given you a credit card and given you a max spending limit that's infinite. And you can just go, and you can just go to town, and every time you sin, there's forgiveness, and you just kind of abuse the grace. Does that make sense? So there's this tension of understanding the, the, the penalty that's been paid by Jesus on the cross is infinite. And it's totally sufficient for forgiveness. And yet, that's not permission to sin. That's not permission to live this life where we're unrepentant and and we're not confessing and we're we're just continuing to kind of abuse that and rack up that no maximum spending limit type metaphor. Otherwise, it would be easy to fall into the trap of the Pharisees. Jesus tells a parable about prayer with a Pharisee and a tax collector in Luke 18. And the Pharisee, who just has this total self-righteous viewpoint, prays this prayer, God, I thank you I'm not like other people. I thank you that I'm so good and so righteous. And we can do that. Even in Christ, we can kind of have that perspective. God, I thank you that I'm so good and I'm so righteous. And even if we're acknowledging the righteousness be given us from God, or you can pray this kind of prayer. It's the prayer of the tax collector. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And at the end of that parable, Jesus asked the question, so which one of those two is justified? Who left that place justified? What's the answer? The tax collector. And it's really simple why. Because the tax collector wasn't abusing the righteousness he had. The tax collector still recognized his need for mercy. And that's why Jesus teaches us not just to have a one-time prayer of forgiveness when we're saved, but to continue to go back to God for that same forgiveness. And we can bank on it. But the sufficiency of Christ on the cross and the resurrection is powerful enough. It's not like some sketchy Craigslist person you meet with where you're selling them something and you said, only cash, you know, and you get there and they're like, I know you said only cash, but I, I just got to check, wait a week to, you know, cash it because I'm not sure. That's not the cross. The cross is paid in full, okay? It's something like God promises this to us, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you can have 100% confidence in your forgiveness, and yet we should never abuse that. In fact, whenever we continue to sin, go back and ask that God would continue to apply that payment to our lives. And as we do so, we watch the Holy Spirit sanctify us more and more and more. So this leads us to a specific kind of prayer called examination. It's kind of a specific way of listening prayer, but also confession. Uh, And we see this kind of prayer. David prays this in uh, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. He says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. 
That's what Jesus is praying when he's, when he's talking about lead me not into temptation. We're just appealing to God to lead us day by day by day. And so th- this kind of prayer of examination is not just you examining yourself. It's you inviting the Holy Spirit. It's you kind of laying your life bare before God and asking God to examine you, asking the Holy Spirit to point things out and highlight things to you. And uh, the prayer of examine was actually popularized by a guy named St. Ignatius of Loyola. And uh, he's actually Basque, right? That's kind of cool. In Boise, we have Basque community. He was actually from the Basque part of Spain. And you know, he really kind of uh, popularized this prayer of examine. He probably did it using uh, Latin words, but we're just going to look at a simplified version today. So I would encourage you to maybe jot these steps down. The prayer of examine is a really helpful way to make sure you're not just ignoring your own sin. Because for us, I know for, you, for me, but f- for you, what we often do is when we have sin in our lives, even as a follower of Jesus or maybe even not, we do a few things. Number one, we like to minimize it. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. I'm sure they knew I was joking. I'm sure it didn't matter. I'm sure, I'm sure that you know, sin wasn't that big of a deal. And we have to acknowledge it was a big deal. In fact, every sin, the wage of every sin is death, eternal death. And the other thing we do is we justify sin, like, oh, it's just because I'm like that. I'm just a mean person, right? You know, I just have that mean personality type, or it's just because of my family of origin, and you know, I had a difficult day, and we kind of justify it, and we give excuses, we make excuses. We shift the blame. It was their fault, it was her fault, it was his fault. They were asking for it, those kind of things. And then if we're just honest, sometimes we don't confess our sins because we're really just not paying attention, we haven't slowed down enough to acknowledge the fact that there's still wrongdoing that we do in our lives. That's why the prayer of examine is really helpful. So four steps, four simple steps for prayer of examine. Uh, the first one is replay. Go through your day and just replay it moment by moment, hour by hour. Uh, the prayer of examine is not a prayer to be done first thing in the morning because otherwise you would wake up, you would replay your day, and you'd say, what did I do today? I woke up. Okay, like, no, you do it in the afternoon, do it in the evening, you could do it at the end of a week. You could pray the prayer of examine for a whole week uh, and just replay the day. If it helps to have a journal and jot down like your schedule, think of like the three meals that you ate that day and then what happened in between those meals. That's a good way to replay your day. Uh, the next thing you do is rejoice. We talked about this two weeks ago. Notice God. There are moments in your life and in your day where God was at work and I was not aware of it, right? And so these are, these are times to just pause and to think of the ways that maybe God helped you or protected you or, or God led you in some way, and you can just acknowledge and glorify God and praise him and thank him. So replay, rejoice, and then the third one is repent. As you are truly stilling your soul and listening to God, this is a specific form of listening prayer, and if you were to ask the Holy Spirit the question, Holy Spirit, how did I not do God's will today? There's going to be some content there. I can almost guarantee it on a daily basis. A thought, maybe, that that was wrong, uh, words that you said, actions that you did, and just repent of those things. Say, Father, forgive me for those things. And I thank you that you do forgive me, just as I forgive those who have wronged me. Just repent and go before God. That's where sanctification happens. That's where growth happens. Acknowledging the need for mercy, thanking, going back to the cross and the gospel time and time again, and then growing from that place and allowing God to cleanse you more and more and more and more. And then the, the fourth step is reboot. Maybe that's not the best word, but it works with the alliteration. So there you go. <laughs> reboot. Maybe a, a, another way to say it is reset. And it's basically just this idea of you realize that God's mercies are new every morning. Tomorrow is a new day, and you just recommit to following Jesus tomorrow. You recommit to, to, to conforming into the image of God tomorrow. You recommit to walking by the Spirit tomorrow. And you can sleep at ease having done this, because you can bank on the forgiveness and the grace in which you stand. You've just rejoiced in God, and you're hopeful about the future as opposed to cynical about the future and feeling like you're just in this endless cycle of not following Jesus in your life. So here's our main point for today. It's this, when we pray, the main thing we need God to change is us. That's what yielding kind of prayer teaches us. That we often feel like, God, I just, if I just had you fix this, or if you just changed my situation, or if you just, and the finger's pointed everywhere else, right? And it's not bad. Sometimes it is good to ask God to do things around us. But when we get to these yielding kind of prayers, what we really realize is the main thing we need God to change is in here. It's in our soul, and we need more and more to become like Jesus. 
I love how Richard Foster puts it. He says this, prayer changes things, people say. That's true, prayer does change things. It also changes us. The latter goal is the more imperative. The primary purpose of prayer is to bring us into such a life of communion with the Father that by the power of the Spirit, we are increasingly conformed into the image of the Son. That's prayer. It's one of the most difficult kinds of prayer, yielding, allowing God to to take our will, loosening our grip on our will, and taking hold of God's will. And yet Jesus teaches us, his is the burden that's light. His is the the yoke that is easy. And it's actually following him and his way of life that we can find life to the full. So I would challenge you, yield to God. If there's ways that you've been in sin, maybe living your life in sin, yield to God. If there's suffering that you feel like you've, you've prayed more than three times, you've prayed 30 times, you've prayed 300 times that God, to take this from you, but he hasn't yet, maybe, that, maybe God's inviting you to just loosen your grip and yield to him in that situation. If there's a direction in your life where you're, you feel like you're trying to pry open a locked door, that God has clearly closed the door and is trying to get you to go a different direction in your life, yield to him and stop trying to go that way and ask God, which way would you have me go in my life? Because at the end of the day, the main thing we need God to change is us. 